What's up everyone? So here it is, the little vintage Chromecast TV I gave you guys a little quick snippet of in my first video on this channel, which was, uh, as I said, it was like a five second snippet out of a 20 minute rambling session about my computer. So I was honestly quite surprised to see so many comments generated about, you guys want to see more about it, what a cute little TV. I agree with a lot of people's comments. This is a very cute TV and it's part of the reason why I saved this thing from the, uh, the trash heap that I actually found the Aptiva in. Now very quickly, if you're not sure what, what one of these things are, this is a $35 internet streaming device, not only an internet streaming device, it can stream your local content that you have on your own media server, computer, PC, uh, or uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, phone or tablet, whether it's Android or iOS. But uh, most importantly, unlike other streaming solutions by Roku or Amazon Fire TV Stick, this thing, you don't deal with this at all. Person, you don't you don't deal with this thing. What how you work with this is through your phone or tablet. So if you want to set up the Wi-Fi on it, for instance, or find something to watch, you do it all through your phone or your tablet or even your PC. So that's perfect for an old TV like this because basically this has a couple of things going against it as we've moved on as a society from standard definition and the 4-3 aspect ratio. And when I say that, that means it's not widescreen. Basically, it's that you're going to have a really bad time trying to, if this thing had a required a remote to choose what you're watching or set up Wi-Fi, well, you're not going to be able to see it in an old TV like this. And uh, there's nothing truly remarkable that I've done here by, by connecting an HDMI device to an old TV with a series of adapters that I will show you. But basically, what I've done is given this TV the ability for it to automatically turn itself on and then turn itself off after a set amount of inactivity. And the way that I did that is I've actually used this. Not the lights themselves, but the actual, the little, the little uh, timer section here. I've just removed the motion sensor and plugged in a sound source so basically when something is playing it wakes up the timer circuit in here and instead of turning on the lights it turns on the TV. So without further ado I'm going to go ahead and kick off the demonstration by using my phone as the remote control to turn this TV on and start playing something. Okay so before I launch into a demonstration on this thing let me just point out that this little guy is just plugged directly into the wall. Everything that's required to make this thing works is built inside, so there's not a bunch of stuff spewing out of the back that becomes cumbersome and, and very unattractive to look at. Now this TV was made in April of 1978, so it's going to be 38 years old in just a few days. And uh, yeah, that's that was the important part for me, is that it, it looked very clean, just the way it was supposed to be. So if you want to move this to another room, all you got to do is... Uh, lower down the antennas, unplug it from the wall, and pick it up by the handle and just move it. That's it. There's no nothing to set up. Just plug it back in and it's ready to go again. So here's how you turn this TV on. Well, it would have been this way. Right now it's in automatic mode, so it's waiting for something to be uh, cast to it from the Chromecast or from your phone. So it actually does not turn on by just doing that but I've got it set to a, a good volume so that when we do start casting to it you'll hear it sort of come to life so I'm just gonna use YouTube here as you can see let me close out my notifications so just go to YouTube and we're gonna check out some content from lazy game reviews because he puts out awesome videos and if you're not subscribed to him you should subscribe because he is awesome and he's been kind enough to let me use his content for this demonstration as I told him that a lot of his videos get watched on this very TV at this very table because the TV normally lives in that corner there. So let me go ahead and hit play. Now there's nothing too amazing here. Greetings and welcome to LGR. I'm just playing it on my phone as usual. So to send this video to the red TV, all I have to do is hit this little cast icon in the corner. You see it right there, cast. And that brings up a menu, and I want to cast it to the red TV. So let's just wait a few seconds, and you will see the, hear the TV come to life. It'll take a few seconds for the picture to come up. <laughs> there we go. That's probably my least favorite fast food place. But I do like these kind of stupid gimmicky things. Uh, old crappy headphones in the shape of uh, burgers for some reason. And yes, insert a Simpsons reference here. Although those were earmuffs, these are proper headphones with an AM radio that may or may not work after these many years, but uh, we're about to find out once we unbox this thing. Sorry, collectors. So I'm gonna go ahead and just, the equivalent oops. Of two Whopper value meals. I'm just gonna go ahead and lower this a little bit. Too bad opening it up. I had no idea 
that back in the early So I'm staying sort of farther away from the from the TV because if I get close to it the camera starts doing picking up some weird designs which you can't see with the human eye but that's basically the, because there's like a screen door effect on this on these old TVs and it really sort of it just wreaks havoc with the camera so I'm trying to give you guys the best uh, example of how this TV looks um, through a camera and it's very difficult so you get how that works your uh, your phone becomes the remote control and this is a perfect remote control because you can find the content you want you could fire up Netflix Hulu whatever there's a whole list of things that the Chromecast is uh, is compatible with but uh, we're just using YouTube for this, so you can do all the usual. You can pause. You can scan around. I could restart the video. I can turn the volume back up. All that good stuff. So this TV actually has a second function, and that's to be an audio streaming device. So by plugging in an auxiliary cord to the back of it, I've put a little jack right here. It's a stereo output from the Chromecast. So I'm going to use some music that my brother made here, as it's not uh, going to give me any copyright problems. Actually, let me turn down the stereo. And there's the audio there. Now let me turn up the stereo here. You can even turn the TV completely off because the Chromecast stays live. And you can do all the same stuff like lower the volume. You don't have to have the phone on or the screen on. Here's how Google Play Music shows artwork. And it's perfect for watching music videos. So I'll go ahead and demonstrate the automatic shutdown. So as soon as I stop casting here, and silence begins, I'll start the timer and the TV will shut down in about five minutes. So there you go, five minutes right on the dot, fully automatic. I'm gonna go ahead and answer some questions that I assume people are gonna be wondering why I did or didn't do certain things uh, on this project. And uh, while I do that, I'm gonna superimpose some video on the screen here of this TV. It's gonna be an actual recording of this TV playing content recorded. But as you've noticed, you've been watching me do this throughout the video which is darkening everything up so I really can't have the best of both worlds in one shot so that's why I'm gonna superimpose it because normally when I have it like this everything looks washed out and blown out it doesn't look like that to my eyes but the camera just cameras are very limited in what they can do with lighting situations and this is a source of light so it really messes with the camera okay so let's answer some questions number one I figured people were gonna ask wonder why I didn't gut this thing out and put all new internals in it like I did with my IBM Aptiva. Well, there's quite a few reasons for that actually, and I'm gonna go ahead and disrupt the montage. Because first of all, take a look at the way the screen looks when the TV is off. See, it has sort of a glow to it. Not a glow, but it's reflecting light that's coming at it. And also you can see the reflections of like the windows there. You can, you can see that. If I just stuck an LCD in here, you would lose that. And it wouldn't look authentic because LCDs are black dark so right off the bat it would look weird if I did that secondly this TV still worked and my attraction to old stuff like this is yes it's the way that it looks yeah. I'm also interested in the way that it works let me see if there's a uh, how machine what is it with the the secret life of machines episode I can annotate right here you can check out I'm sure they have one on TVs and you should see how they work because I think that's interesting so that's that's my point these old TVs are interesting, so I didn't want to just cheat and throw an LCD in there. If this TV gets to a point where I cannot service it any longer, or the picture tube has just died to a point where it's too dim to watch and it's, it's just it's done,
then I'll have to put an LCD in it and that's a, that's a day that I'm not looking forward to because I really love the way this TV looks. I love, it's got a charm about its picture. No, it's not an HD TV and uh, it's extremely low resolution. So that's pretty much why I didn't gut it out. I'm definitely interested in the way this old stuff works and if there's a way that I can make it work while retaining its original uh, engineering and function, then this is a case where I'll do that. Okay, so question number two is actually, I'm having a sort of a tough time explaining this one, and that's basically, why didn't I put an HDMI output on the back of the TV so I can plug in different things? Well, because I can tell you right now that the beauty of this system is all through the Chromecast, and there's really nothing else that I would want to plug into it. It really adds insult to injury, as I've said a few times already, this TV has an ultra low resolution compared to most CRT televisions, and that's just because of its portable nature. They just didn't have enough real estate on the screen to pack it with those little red, green, and blue grid things, or whatever they're called. I know they're not called pixels on an old TV like this, but whatever those are called, they didn't have enough room to pack a bunch of those onto a small screen like that. I want to correct something. I don't mean to say that all CRT televisions are like super low resolution. I mean this TV is super low resolution because it's a 10 inch screen. It's a little TV and I think its main selling point was that it was portable and that it was color. So it wasn't about its 400 lines of resolution that uh, the, 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 the standard definition can, can give you. That's why I didn't put uh, an HDMI port on the back. Okay, so before I get into the teardown of the TV, I'm going to show you what the adapters would look like if they weren't all, the wiring wasn't condensed down and it wasn't all built into the TV. This is a very unappealing mess and uh, it really would make a project like this just, eh, I, I wouldn't want to do something like this if I couldn't build it into the TV, to be completely honest. It, it's just, it's, it's just a disaster. So basically you can see we've got an RF modulator the HDMI to composite video adapter and analog output and the Chromecast and I'm throwing this in here just to show you how this TV is actually connected inside so let me just start from the beginning and show you how it's all hooked up so this is going to apply from any TV from like the late 40s until like the mid the mid 80s or so some TVs or a lot of TVs still had the old twin lead 300 ohm VHF connections and that was basically for antennas would hook up into that so there'd be two little uh, wires that would literally just loop over to those so what this little thing does first of all so if your TV only has these then you're gonna need to get one of these this is a 300 ohm twin lead to 75 ohm VHF adapter so it gives you that on the back so pretty much any TV from the or even early 80s to mid 80s are just, you're gonna at least have this on the back. I mean TVs today still have this on the back. Okay, so that goes to a cable. Let me see if I can get that in there. Okay, good enough. That's going through a coaxial cable. Um, don't worry about the where it's going through the mess, but it's coming in here. This is your first adapter. Well, second adapter if you're doing it like this. So this is an RF modulator. It basically takes, uh, puts out an RF signal, which combines video and audio. And this is where you get the channel three and four deal. And it adds a um, composite video input and audio input. This is a mono model right here. Because most of them will have, as you'll see inside the TV, the one I have, I have in there is a stereo one. So it has all three of these get used. And then from there, you're gonna go from a com to a composite HDMI, well it's an HDMI to composite adapter, okay? And this is like 15 bucks. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this separately because there's one major flaw with this thing. And this is how you finally get your HDMI input right there. That's it. So I'm gonna talk about connection options at this point. If you have a TV from, the, a higher end TV from the uh, 80s, you're gonna be lucky enough to probably have composite video input right on the back of that. So all you're gonna need is an HDMI to composite adapter. If your TV has an S-Video input, then I would opt for an HDMI to S-Video adapter. So you're gonna have an S-Video out here and then you're gonna have the two audio analog outputs right there. 
and that will give you a, a better picture. So uh, higher end TVs from the 90s would have an S-Video input. It's possible that S-Video was on higher end TVs in the 80s, and actually I know there were, but they're far and in between. So uh, there you go. That's one way to go. If your TV, as I've already said, has one of these, then you're going to go ahead and get an RF modulator. So you can get composite video input. I want to just give you a, a fair warning here. First of all, if, um, if you were expecting some sort of crazy, super clean job, like I did on my IBM Aptiva, which is, uh, I think a lot of my subscribers are subscribed to me from that project, so I assume you saw that video. Be prepared for a world of shock, because basically, that's not what this was about. When I built this TV, all I was concerned with was, is it going to work? And is it not going to burn my house down? Just those two reasons. That's it. So, let's, uh, let's spin it around. Now, in my original version of the uh, teardown, I pulled it all apart. Well, I'll be honest with you. I've been editing the video, and I've been taking a look at what I did. And it really did just seem kind of redundant, in a sense, because you just saw the uh, scene where I was uh, explaining all the different adapters, you know, the big messy one where it was all like right here. And basically, yeah, you get the point. If you saw it there, then this is the same thing. And it's, uh, it's, it's I'll just show you the signal path. But before I do that, let me give you two important warnings. And one of them is about safety, first of all. If you are opening up one of these TVs, you need to make sure that it is unplugged. Do not ever run an old TV like this, or anything for that, uh, or anything for that matter, while it's still plugged in, okay? And if you take a look around these old things, you will see warnings everywhere. High voltage, high voltage, x-rays, there's another warning there, there's another warning hiding behind the HDMI adapter, see that yellow tag? Here's a warning down here, and uh, there's even a warning engraved in the side saying that this is a uh, 70 volts above ground AC so yeah be very mindful and have respect for these things because they will bite you or possibly even kill you and there's been quite a few deaths throughout time with these uh, things in existence so this is the high voltage section here this is the flyback transformer and it produces a lot of voltage and when you uh, you can you can unplug this thing all you want, and if you start poking your ha hands around there while it's unplugged, well, these things, the tube, and that can hold a charge still. So you need to look up on the internet, and I will give you a link in the description to a video where you can visually see how to safely discharge a CRT. Okay, you have to do this. All right, I don't want to be responsible for anybody hurting themselves because they're attempting to create a rat's nest like I did inside this TV. Second thing is be very careful for the uh, the back of the CRT neck, okay? If you nudge this the wrong way, this is thin glass, and uh, there's quite a few ways, whether through the pins or actually cracking the glass, that you can let air into the tube. And then once that happens, it's over with. Start looking for an LCD to put inside of your uh, your project here if you still even want to work with, you know, you, you happen to like the way the TV looks or something. Well, you're, you're probably not going to find a CRT to replace it with, okay? These things are very hard to find in 2016, and imagine four years from now when people are still looking at this video, it's going to be even harder to find a replacement CRT. So either start looking for a new TV project or find yourself an LCD that's going to fit inside your project because you've just destroyed that tube, okay? So, with that being said, let's take a look at what's going in here. So what I'm going to do is, let's see, I'll start from the Chromecast. So the Chromecast, there it is, it's going into the HDMI to composite adapter, and then it's going into an RF modulator, which that is plugged into. And I've avoided using uh, patch cables on this by using these little barrel connectors that I'll, I'll show you in a second when I take this thing out. And here we have our 75 ohm uh, coaxial cable coming up here. 
going around there, finally coming back here into, remember those uh, 300 ohm twin lead VHF adapters? And that VHF or 300 ohm twin lead thingy is just soldered to the back of these two. That's it. That's the whole system there. You want to make sure that any of your wiring is not rubbing up on anything that generates heat or is sharp and could eventually wear through one of the wires. You just, you don't want, uh, at the very least, you're going to burn out one of your low voltage uh, devices like the Chromecast, the adapter, or possibly even the RF modulator. And at worst, something could get really hot and potentially start a fire. And it's over at that point if that happens. I don't even think the fuse will grab it. Um, it just won't. So you need to be very mindful of that. Make sure that your wires are not touching anything that generates heat or is sharp, okay? One other thing I want to mention is that I'm also extracting analog audio uh, from the, the RF modulator, and that's going into the jack here, this wire you see right here. And then from that wire, there's also two diodes creating a stereo to mono mix down. Whoops. And that's going into the motion sensor converted timer that's now listening for sound and powering the TV on and off. Now here's the part where I get to disappoint you guys and I'm really sorry because I think a lot of people may have been potentially interested in this aspect of the project, the automatic power on and power off function. I'm not going to go into detail or any detail really on how I did it. And that's for one reason, basically the fact that it's been up and running in my TV for about a month now with no problems. But that doesn't mean I'm ready to say to the world, hey guys, go ahead and uh, buy these things up and follow my exact connections and uh, put them in your TVs. I don't want to be responsible for fires, you know. I mean, this thing could uh, potentially be a problem a month from now. Who knows? I don't know. So it's just not ready for me to uh, share this with you guys. And to be quite honest with you, a better way to do this would have been to use maybe like an Arduino, program it a little bit to uh, uh, listen for sound and trigger a, uh, a timer. So basically a sound triggered, sound activated timer. Okay, so I'm sure there's a project out there. That would be the best way to go. Then that way you're putting in your own relays and you can get the correct, you know, whatever kind of heavy duty relay you, you you'd want to use for if you're using it in a big giant floor model TV or something like that. So that's all there is to say about that. Now you heard me say earlier that the only two things I was concerned with on this project was one that it worked and two that it didn't start a fire. So you're probably wondering why it looks like such a sort of cobbed together hairy mess of crap just stuffed inside of a TV. Well that's basically because this is still a project. I'm not done with this by any means and I'm actually probably most likely going to make a video if I can figure out how to make it work where we revisit this thing and I figure out how to pump direct composite video into the first video amplifier of this TV, effectively turning it into a video monitor. So basically, as I've said, it's a project and a lot of stuff's going to be coming out of this and I don't want to permanently affix everything in certain locations. Now if you have a keen eye, you may have noticed there was a Samsung little cell phone charger in there that was electrical taped to another power adapter. Why didn't I go over that? Well, basically I don't want to lead by example. As I've said, this thing is in sort of a temporary project mode at the time, so I don't want to commit to spending a ton of time and, and, and permanently affixing everything very nice and doing a really super awesome job because I'm probably going to be taking all of this apart again at some point and there's just no reason I'll be taking out components or adding in other components. So as long as I've done everything to a point, as I said, so it doesn't start a fire, it doesn't have to be pretty. Now we have one other thing to talk about, and if you remember I said this, we're going to talk a little bit more about this separately because there's one major flaw with this thing. So the reason that we have to talk about this more is because anybody who's doing this project is going to be in for a really nasty surprise when they find out that these adapters, not just the one I have, but many others like it, all lack one major feature. So what's it doing? It's taking this and squeezing it into a square picture. That totally sucks. I kind of get why they did it because I think the idea is that all right, well, here's our 16.9. We're going to squeeze it to fit into this so you still get to see everything, but it has the drawback of everybody looking sort of skinnier if there's people in there, or if you had an, a perfect circle displayed on the 16.9, now it's going to look like an oval by the time it gets displayed on the screen. 
See, all these adapters lack one important feature, a simple button that allows you to select how to deal with different screen ratios, basically an aspect ratio button, or what do you want to call it, a scale button. So the major, major downfall is this. Say that we're looking at something widescreen coming out of the Chromecast, but it happens to be 4.3 content. What it's going to do is it's going to squeeze that, including the black bars, into the 4.3. So now when you're watching it in this, this was supposed to be perfect for watching 4.3 content. When you're watching this now, everybody's squeezed in and you get these horrible black bars. Oh man, is that such a killer because like I said, this was supposed to be perfect for watching old TVs on and it's ruined by that stupid adapter's inability to do anything with it. Now I've got another adapter coming from Amazon that features a zoom function, but the description doesn't tell you how that actually works. But I figured I'd go ahead and give it a try anyway and see if it's something that can fix this issue. So I'll report my findings in an unlisted video that I'll annotate here right now. So on that note, I think we've finally come to the end of this project, which has not been a very fun video for me to make because I'm just talking and talking and talking and showing off something I already did. My next video, or I should say my next project, is going to be, thankfully, a start to finish project where you guys get to walk through the entire process of building something, which means tools, and that's going to be a lot more fun and interesting for me to uh, create that content for you guys. But you guys know the protocol. If you like this video, go ahead and give me a thumbs up, share, comment, subscribe. It honestly means the world to me and keeps me motivated to create more projects and videos for you guys to watch. So until then, thanks for watching, guys.